Welcome to the Under the Lights podcast. The podcast for up-and-coming cinematographers, lighting camera operators, and photographers. Learn from the professionals and land the bigger projects. Please welcome your host, Cy Gamble. Welcome to Under the Lights, episode two. Our guest this week is documentary lighting camera and DOP Jonathan Young. We got together pre-lockdown 3.0 to chat about his work that stretches literally around the globe and includes some of the world's most dangerous conflict zones. With that said, a bit of a heads up that the second part of this week's podcast features descriptions of war. But before we get started, thank you so much for listening. If you like what you hear, please help spread the message with a like, a comment, or even better, a subscribe. So, let's get on with this week's pod. Please welcome to the podcast, Jonathan Young, leading documentary cameraman. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's pretty pretty, pretty, pretty fair to say. <laughs> there, there, there might be one or two who might disagree with the, sort of the title leading. Um, I wouldn't, I but, definitely uh, wouldn't. C- certainly, I, I have a broad range of experiences over, over a good number of years in sort of, in sort of factual, documentary, actuality-based sort of production. Obviously, you're well known for the the Simon Reeve and, and Ross Kemp series as well, and yeah, I, I do. I have a long, probably 15 year association with Simon Reeve. Um, I've not worked with Ross recently, but I did, you know, a good 10 years with Ross, um, starting with Afghanistan, and then a whole range of programs uh, around the world. Uh, a reportage series called Extreme World, which was uh, extremely successful. Back in the day, I, I did. I used to work with uh, Louis Theroux when he still had uh, full size camera crews with him. Wow, wow! Um, and you know that that came out of a chance. Uh, that, that came out of a kind of a, what I would describe as a network family tree um, from two people I met because I used to work originally in sort of uh, in in news, um, and then I moved into sort of, sort of network television news, and then sort of into network current affairs. I met someone working at Panorama doing network current affairs, and that person then went on to sort of to, to work with Louis Theroux. And our paths kind of that person kind of brought me with them, and that's how things lead on. So you know, one door closes, but another, another opens is the old saying, and and that's one thing I've 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 tried to do is keep in touch with people throughout my entire career because you know, and you you never know where the people you meet today on that kind of reasonably not very well paid small corporate shoot might actually sort of eventually go somewhere else and yeah. you know you 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 make you make contacts and connections it's all about networking you started 1992 was it believe working for Reuters well, was it um my sort of professional full time professional career started in the late eighties as in my sort of late teens. Okay, I worked I worked uh, with two or three sort of cameramen in the Yorkshire region as a sort of local news uh, person. You know, sound recording, lighting, you know, some camera work on sports gigs, just being around kit. And then in nineteen ninety two, I took a staff job with what was the old Viz News, which then became Reuters TV. And in 1993, we went live on air with the um, GMTV, the Good Morning TV contract. So we used to work with Mr. Motivator and do sort of outside broadcasts on sort of um, Blackpool Pleasure Beach, which actually was something I had never done before. I'd never really done live television before. And still now to this day, I still get a real buzz out of live television. How did the the work, obviously, the VC editor that you mentioned as well, how does that obviously help you with, for example, shooting coverage and things later in the Oh, uh, one of the key things I will tell people coming into the industry is learn to edit. Now, I now do not edit at all much. You know, my, my skill base is... Is has waned uh, editing techniques. And, and I mean, I, I used to edit on sort of two-machine tape. But the, 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 the core message is learn to edit because... You, I guarantee that every camera person thinks that they are the greatest camera person since sliced bread. Then learn to edit your own material and you will start to see the mistakes in front of you and what is, uh, what other people are actually wanting from your coverage and your footage. And it's still the, the, the basic principles of two machine, new style editing can be applied pretty much to any 
coverage and sequence and having a mental shopping list of shooting for an edit rather than just shooting because it looks nice or it sounds good yeah. or just your own sort of pet project. Well, at some point, in most cases, you're not making it for you. You're making it for a commissioner. You're making it for an executive. You're making it for a production manager because these people are paying your for your skills, your wages, your kit hire. And so you are in the commercial market. So knowing how to edit and knowing how to to extrapolate sort of you know editorial or editorially um, from what you're shooting, uh, you know, in terms of sort of how how a scene will fit together in terms of the the story the story arc on it in a program at that point or a documentary, will give you a much greater insight. And once you start having that insight, you'll find your filming experience much more interesting. From a coverage point of view as well, men- mentioning that, I mean, this this um, the Simon Reeve Australia helicopter scene um, when you were, I believe you were, were you somewhere out in the outback somewhere, was it? Or? Yeah, no, that that particular program, Simon Reeve in Australia, um, I, I, that was the opening sequence to the series, and it's probably up there with one of the most dramatic things that we have done or I have done in 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 my sort of filming career. I mean. Camels in Australia, not two things that you would automatically put together. I mean, camels are ugly, they smell, and they are brutish, and they don't do as they're told. And there's too many of them from what I was understanding? Yeah, that, there's, they, the they, they were introduced, I think, in the 1930s um, as, a, as a kind of wagon train, sort of as a pack horse animal. But camels breed like rabbits, and but they're a damn sight bigger. And <laughs> these camels went feral, and they started destroying these large sort of Australian outback ranges, uh, ranch farms. I mean, there is a market for for camel meat and sort of camel milk. It's actually very low in cholesterol. They camels can be used uh, as a as a sort of cash crop animal, you know, and milked in the same way to cows are and for meat and what have you. Okay. Uh, and hides. Um, but yeah, they'd just gone feral. And so there are roundups on large ranch stations in Australia. And we had the we were able to film this roundup at the end of the Australian winter. So it's still nearly 40 degrees out there. And we spent a couple of days and we were exhausted the, just chasing around the outback chasing camels in on motorbikes in four wheel drives and with a helicopter now the helicopter part i mean i've filmed with a lot of helicopter pilots over my time and been in lots of helicopters flown by very talented pilots but what this helicopter pilot was able to do in terms of corralling camels i have never seen something so outrageous and so ballsy in all my life I mean, he is flying a small Robinson, which is a very dainty helicopter, very sort of manoeuvrable, and he's literally poking camels in the backside with the skids of the of the <laughs> of the helicopter to sort of to cor- to corral them and move them into their shed. But he's doing this at 10, 15 feet off the it's floor. Amazing! Yeah. His flying skills and tilting the aircraft. I mean, no sane pilot would do something that close to the ground unless they were coming in to just land flat on the skids. But no, he's flinging this thing around as if it's a, as if it's a toy. It's like a, it's almost like a remote controlled aircraft. And we stood there in amazement as he started to fly the the helicopter into the corral and started poking these kind of um these 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 stubborn camels in the backside to move them into the shed, and at times the, so we were behind the, the the steel shutters of the corral, but at times we were less than sort of ten feet from the spinning blade. If, if that, yeah, it was astonishing, and you you go think okay, well that's health and safety, but no, the, he knew what he was doing, and I, I didn't feel unsafe. It was just going. Oh my God! This guy knows what he's doing, and he's probably more scared of me jumping out and getting in the way because he knows that he can do this. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. very, very skilled. Part. I've never seen anything like it since. Quite astonishing piece of flying. Can you just talk me through what what sort of camera positioning you had, how you got the coverage? Yeah, the the the, um, the camel sequence in Australia was covered predominantly by me on, on a standard sort of classic sort of ENG style camera which I've used for a lot of the Simon Reeve programs for robust state and also having sort of long zoom ranges because uh, we don't tend to do a lot of sort of lens changes and a good smattering of GoPros yeah. which we just very simple case of just bolt them on press record and hope they don't fall off and the batteries last 
Because <laughs> um, this was before we even had sort of um, decent sort of moffy juice packs around to sort of power them externally. Um, again, with the helicopter, I think I think we gave a GoPro to the to the helicopter pilot, but we soon realised that he was not going to be able to sort of to do much do much with it um, because of the way he was flying. So it, it, it was a case of being alive to the situation, and it was one of those one of those moments where. I'll just keep rolling because I have no idea what is going to happen here. I know what the ultimately uh, the, the the denouement will be that eventually all these camels will be in this corral and then we can actually think about what how we're going to shoot this. But at the moment it was it was like a scene from Mad Max. It was a case of ladies and gentlemen start your engines and we just raced off into the into the desert <laughs> because they the, the, the they knew where the camels were and we just jumped on these buggies and it was I say it was Mad Max. We were filthy dirty in this sort of red orange sort of uh, Australian dirt, and we just we just went for it. And it, it's a case of just hanging on for dear life. And I will just film <laughs> anything and everything that comes in front of me. And that's you know you you can't you cannot really plan something like that because you know, you know what you like to do, but you know that's what happens. You know this is factual documentary filming. Just cover what comes in front of you. Not not to get anyone in trouble or anything, but from a, from a sort of like risk assessment point of view or anything like that, is there anything that you have to sort of take into consideration, or is it literally the fact that you just trust this guy hundred percent with no, his no, skills? It, 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 a lot of risk assessments on a lot of the shoots I do are done. There's a lot of work done before you leave the office, planning what you're going to do and how it's going to go down. But as we all know, anybody that's ever been on, uh, been filming, you know that sort of no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And in something like this, yeah, there is an, un, an element of unpredictability. So all I can suggest is constantly, dynamically risk assess. Keep your wits about you. Don't just become completely fixated with what you're filming. Keep one eye open. It's a skill you need to learn to sort of to have eye, eyes in the back of your head. You, most camera people who do sort of what we do, they will they will develop a sixth sense. They know something's going on. I mean, because often the, sort of the camera person is the blindest person on the shoot because you've got a camera on your shoulder blocking half of your vision. Definitely. One eye is closed because you're looking down the viewfinder. So you've only got your left eye because obviously there's, you know, cameras sit or, or are predicated to be on the right-hand side of the body. Uh, and if you're shooting by yourself and you've got headphones on, you're also deaf. You can only hear what's going on from on the microphone on the camera or if you're using radio mics. But your ears are technically, if you're using radio mics, your ears are technically on someone's chest. This is the thing. I, I, I remember um, when I first started out, I had one of the first contracts that I had was in motorsport and um, actually in um, stock car racing. And exactly that happened to me. I had the headphones on, looking down the viewfinder, stood on an embankment, um, following something coming down the back straight, which is very, probably two, three hundred metres away. Um, felt a sudden shake in the earth, took the camera, the eyepiece off, and literally a foot beneath my feet was a, a mini uh, mini clubman all smashed to pieces. Like literally, well, yeah, it was so I, dangerous. I, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, unless you're filming in a, a studio and everything you're filming is controlled and consensual has been planned, anything can actually go wrong. And despite how much second guessing and forethought you have put into your your shoot planning, there is always going to be something that will actually um, just get in the way. I mean, funny example. We were. Um, I mean, it's not a danger example, but we were, we many many years ago. I went to Jamaica um, for a food program. Um, we had trekked for about two and a half, three hours through the upper reaches of the Blue Mountains in, in Jamaica to film the opening of the series on a coffee, a coffee plantation. And all we were doing was going to be there at a very specific time because once the the rains have fallen at three o'clock in the afternoon, you can then see why these plantations or these coffee plantations are called the Blue Mountains because of the sort of the blue-grey cloud around the, 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 the base of the mountains. So it sits there and... Just as we reached the point and the presenter set up and the shot's perfect and the light, the, 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 sort of the clouds have started to move and the light has started to come down, it looks fantastic. The very second the presenter opens her mouth, there is this... And it was a pneumatic drill. It was coming oh, wow. from the other side of the mountains. We couldn't see it. We couldn't signal to it. There was no phone service. There was no communications. And our entire opening... No one had planned, you know, everyone went, oh, but the top of the mountain, there's no phone signal, there's no, it's completely quiet, it'll be, nothing's, nothing's going to happen. And suddenly, 
a large pneumatic drill started up exactly the moment the, project, project, the presenter went, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Another time we were sort of filming, um, you know, sort of extraneous noise issue, we, uh, filming with Donald McIntyre, filming the, um, uh, on the, the Rwandan side of the Partners Volcan in the Ruangari Mountains, filming the Highland Gorillas. And again, we'd set off at about 5.30 in the morning to uh, at about 8,000 feet we were able to drive to. And then we clambered through virgin rainforest to 11,500 feet to finally see what we had come for, which is this incredible sight of these incredibly rare Highland Mountain Gorillas. We are talking meeting your nearest sort of animal cousins. I mean, these people, the, wow. the, the gorillas are 99% sort of human genus. I mean, you are staring at evolution in the face when you come close. And we had trekked for several hours, pulling ourselves up through vines and lobelia leaves. And we were absolutely worn out. And again, all, again, all we can hear is the panting of our own breath and sort of you know, the creaking of our back, carrying the kit up there. And then suddenly the, 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 the guides goes, shh, shh. And then this lobelia leaf just peeled open. And the first time we see is this gorilla's face. And there's these hushed tones. And I can hear my, I can hear my heart beating. I can hear the, sort of the whirring of the, sort of the, the, the mechanism on the, the, the digibeta camera at the time against, against the side of my head. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, um, Eminem's eight mile starts playing on sort of a mobile phone time, <laughs> mobile, mobile phone ring. And it was, we trekked for hours. And suddenly this gorilla, head popped up, heard the mobile phone sound, and went, oh. And literally looked just like, you know, <laughs> what are you doing here in my front room almost? <laughs> and just turned tail and went straight back into the, oh, uh, no. straight back into the, into the undergrowth. And at this point, the producer is absolutely doing his nut with our porter guide, because how would he manage to get a phone signal? We are at 11,500 feet in a, in a rural sort of Rwandan mountaintop. But suddenly he'd got a phone signal, and his phone goes off, and it's Eminem, just like this ringtone. And, and we thought, okay, this is weeks of work. Is that, is that it? Or was that the only gorilla we're going to see for about 30 seconds, popping, popping, whose head popped through the other leaves, and now we've scared them off with a blooming f- ringtone? <laughs> So we're going to take a quick break here, just a quick moment to tell you about a fantastic competition we're running to win a signed copy of Doug Allen's book, Freeze Frame. We'll be back soon. Under the Lights Podcast. Hello, it's me again, back to tell you about our fantastic competition that we've got to win a personalised and signed copy of Doug Allen's book, Freeze Frame. All you have to do is answer the following question, which is... Doug Allen graduated from university in 1973 with a degree in which subject? That is, Doug Allen graduated from university in 1973 with a degree in which subject? Send your answers to hello at utlpod.com, short for under the lights pod, and we'll draw a winner at random on our Facebook page at utlpod at the end of this series. Get your entries in now. Under the lights podcast. Welcome back, everybody. I'm still here with Jonathan Young. Let's chat about your work with Simon Reeve and, uh, okay. and your continue on that that route. And you're working specifically in El Salvador as well. There's some interesting moments at the, the end of the first series where uh, you're all kitted up, bulletproof vest. Yes. Up. <laughs> no, no, it was it was uh, it was a pretty it was a, it was a pretty it was a pretty big evening that evening actually. Sort of, we went out with uh, this was the series, the uh, North America, Central America series that was on BBC Two last year. Um, we finished the uh, the series um, in the Central American states, and we passed through El Salvador. We wanted to look at sort of one of the reasons why a lot of people migrate from the Central American sort of countries to Mexico and further north to, to North America. And it, unfortunately, it stems from partly American foreign policy over the last forty years. And also the sort of the which you know partly is hand in hand with the drug trade, and unfortunately the drug trade and the sort of the drug gangs, the sort of you know MS13 and sort of Salvatrucha, have been the scourge of people, uh, ordinary people in Honduras, uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua especially. And so we went out with a team from uh, they call the STO. They're like a sort of a paramilitary police force, who, but kind of crack stormtrooper sort of special forces type police officers who have a the job of basically taking down 
gang leaders uh, from MS-13 and, and, and Salvatrucha in, um, uh, in, in, the, in the various barrios in San Salvador. And so they took us out for a, on one of their sort of their evening raids. Um, and we, you know, at first we thought, to ourselves, well, we've done a few things in the past and sort of, is this actually, are we getting a real sense of what's going on here? And we went to a few places and we thought, to ourselves, well, maybe they, they've, Taking us to a place that's a little bit safer than than they expected, because all they want to do, because I would imagine there are some TV crews, all they want to see is a few men in uniforms um, knocking on doors, you know, a few gang symbols, and maybe an arrest. But we we like in the programs we like to present what's really going on, really get a, a sense of the, the the situation rather than sort of being allowed to be taken part in some sort of codded kind of event. And we got the sense that this might have been uh, not not sort of codded in any way, but it, we just weren't being shown absolutely everything. So um, we made representations to the team partway through the evening, and eventually they went, "Okay, we're going now." And we literally tore off at a rate of knots through a barrio, and the atmosphere changed. It gone from being tense but controlled to no. I, I've been on enough police raids and sort of out with military units. You can see these guys are now actually gearing up for something like for the first time. You can see the body language change. You can see, you know, the the, the people start tensing up and what have you. And we thought, okay, this this is this is interesting. And we started riding through the back streets of San Salvador. And then we just pulled up at breakneck speed outside a sort of a gated sort of community in a small barrio. And these guys were out of the cars, fully armed. And there was no sort of arrival. There was no sort of, and they literally, the, the, the flood of lights into the area. And we went through the doors of the gate. And within seconds, there were people on the ground sort of being arrested as, as, as potential gang members. Once they'd secured the entrance and sort of made a lot of noise and a lot of excitement coming through sort of the gates and sort of, you know, doors started opening and then people started disappearing and sort of, you know, people started running down corridors. And eventually these, these the, the STO guys, they just, they, they started putting doors in, you know, and, and it was, there was no, there was no sense that this in any way, shape or form was a stunt for, a prearranged stunt. This was for real. They... I think they got the sense saying, no, no, if you all right, you want to see some real bad guys, we're gonna find you some. And they just went for it. And they just started to <laughs> stop putting doors through with sledgehammers. And and just, you know, because that's what they do in real life. They do uh, they're a crack operational unit who who these kind of blitzkrieg style um raids to catch the senior gang members in the various barrios who run sort of MS-13 and the, and the other gangs, catch them unawares and catch them in the middle of it and actually take them out because these people have caused misery for the people in in their local communities. And they ride roughshod over sort of, you know, these these communities, sort of you know, this, this power base that they have. And so they go in and try and take the head of the snake off. And they went for it. They literally started going through doors and we had no idea, again, what was going to happen. You know, there could have been people behind those doors who were prepared to sort of open fire on these officers. How much are you aware of that at the time of actually filming? I mean, I assume when you get back, that's the sort of time to actually sort of reflect and actually think about what's got, what's just happened. But at the time when you've got the, obviously you're rigged up and everything, um, how, how much are you able to process what's going off and where the dangers are? Processing danger and keeping a situational awareness is actually sort of two things that can only be taught through experience. I I would be guilty of uh, guilty of saying that in my early days I probably had less situational awareness because it was all about following the shot. Now I realise, you know, okay, these guys are going to start going through doors. There could be someone behind that door prepared to open fire, but we're stood next to a window. Get behind hard cover. You know, I guarantee if something happens, it will be dramatic. You don't have to be in the prime position. Now... You want to be in a position where you can protect yourself and your colleagues. Um, so you, you, it's remembering to take stock. And when a, in a fast-moving situation, it's remembering to take stock. And, I, and I've been guilty of, of, of race in, the, in my early days, just racing forward and thinking, no, no, I've got to get the shot. In fact, now it's a case of step back. You might actually get a better shot. 
Like it. Oh, that's, that's some good advice there. That's really good. My first overseas assignment of in a sort of active was, and I went to sort of to Bosnia um, to work for the Reuters uh, APTA or, or WTN. That's what in those days they're sort of the agency pool because they used to share resources because it was so dangerous. Uh, and I remember uh, a rival network had set up, and someone had sort of work, was working for them, and I watched him from a distance leaping about over vehicles and trying to get closer and closer to a to a situation and he was the only person that did this and everyone he's a fool he's he's going to get he's going to get himself killed we can actually see from this position we can see everything that's going on we can see what we need to see to tell the story now that's 25 years ago things have moved on since then you know there there are a lot of people who have embedded themselves as it's now known at the very front line. I mean, I've done that. And so the, the there's a blurring of the lines between sort of who is actually neutral and who is actually involved. The media has actually been used in many, many cases now uh, to help sort of tell story from, say, one side over another, partly because you can't often get access to the other side. Um through political interference or sheer danger and what have you. So the days of, of purely highly neutral observers being rep, being um, being recognised by both sides, I think, have moved away. So you have to be mindful of the fact that not only are you telling the story of the people that you're with and what they're doing, you have to be also the neutral observer and remember that there is another story, you know, so for every, it's the old phrase about so for everyone sort of freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. So you have to remember that you are, you are the neutral observer and that is your position and you do what you can to tell the story of the people that you're with. But also you have to sort of be honest and tell the story of the people who, are, who, who, you're, who, are, who you're going against almost. If you're going with a military force to take out a group of people, there has to be some allowance that... The, the the people that they're going against, they have their right to to, to a story. If you're going to be if you are going to be neutral, I mean, some people don't. They just it's all about sort of action and excitement. I think that's one of the things that comes across actually really well. Just jumping back in time as well with your work on the Ross Kemp uh, ISIS documentary, mm-hmm. the documentary you're on the front line of the fight against mm-hmm. ISIS yep. in Syria, um, sort of heading heading over the border. I believe was it at that point or were you? We were um, filming in an area called Rojava, which. Is a, is a Syrian area, but it's also a Kurdish Syrian area. Now, the Kurdish people have a, 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 a traditional homeland that stretches across Iran, Iraq, Syria, and a large part of Turkey. And the area of Rojava is, in a, is a sort of strip of, of northern Syria, which has always been predominantly ethnically Kurdish, but was populated in the 1970s by, um, by sort of Assad, the father, um, and to, to, to Arabize it. Um, so the the fight against ISIS. So with the with the sort of the collapse of of, uh, of modern day Syria into the internecine warfare that's going on between the government forces, I, IS, Daesh, um, and the Kurds and various other sort of factions playing regionally, it meant there was this real sort of melting pot um, of borders to be crisscrossed because there are strategic geographical borders there are sort of political borders and there are regional ethnic borders as well and knowing where you are at any one point in all of this is really quite difficult so yeah there's this one point in in the ross kemp fight on isis uh, program where yes you've gone to a village that's literally i'm gonna say days prior to your arrival has just been liberated from isis and the fighters have managed to push them back is that yes, correct the, the that particular that particular front line uh, was a fairly fluid line between uh, the Syrian democratic forces, which were an amalgam of Syrian Arabs and Kurdish fighters from the YPG, um, and the, they were fighting against sort of very determined ISIS Daesh uh, members. We'd gone to we'd a, we'd asked to go to a frontline position, and as with all these things, be careful what you wish for, because <laughs> we got more than we bargained for. Um, we knew it was going to be a, an active frontline position, 
But when you see the film and there's myself and Ross who went all the way out to the very, very front line on the, the behind the sort of the, the, the sort of the bunkers and the sandbags to see the 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 soldiers fighting against ISIS. I mean, when I when I did was able to get the sort of camera over the top, I could see the body of a dead ISIS fighter about four four hundred meters in front of me. He he had, this guy had decided to break cover from his sniping position and just try and make a sing, a single a single man charge up up the hill into this position and he was he was taken out by the by the by the Syrian um, Syrian Democratic forces and the Kurdish forces. But that position, we were pinned down. I mean, I, I've had people say to me in the past, "Oh, but when you've done these documentaries, do you put that in on green screen, or do you, do you add the sound effects afterwards, or were you really there? Was it like that?" And I go, "Yes, it was." I've ne- I've never ever taken part in anything that has been presented as anything other than it was. And it's it, it was literally. You, there's one point one point where you you're literally in a trench behind behind some sandbags, and you can see the bullets bouncing off the yeah, wall that, behind. That, that there was a there was a that that position. We went out. Uh, the other team members were in the building that's being hit by the sniper, and Ross and I went out onto the front line to do a few pieces to camera and get a few shots to come back in. But then. Because we'd gone down onto that position, clearly the, the the ISIS sniper had seen additional movement more than was expected, so started opening fire with a high high velocity, high powered sort of sniper rifle from their position of about six hundred meters away. And when you start seeing those rounds, he was sizing up who was there, and you know those rounds were just above our heads. I mean, we, we were sort of sort of burying, burying with our belt buckles at that point in, into the sand, trying to get as low as we physically could to sort of to stay out of the line of fire. And every single round that went into that building above us and was going up as we tried to go back into the building, that's that's genuine, that's real. That's not that's not just a, uh, an affectation. That all happened. Uh, in front of us, and you know, for anyone to claim that, that wasn't real or we've staged it in some way, you know, it's impossible. You couldn't do that sort of thing. I mean, just just, just tell me about obviously the kit. You're, you're on the front line. You, you're in a trench. What what kit can you physically take there? What kit's actually safe to take there as well? Um, when covering front line type scenarios in the past, you would be restricted in just using a full size, large shoulder mounted camcorder. Really? Wow. It used to, because that was that's all that was available. Um, then as kit has got smaller and the, the big cameras are still expensive and given the, the, the need to be flexible and manoeuvrable, you tend to carry small lightweight cameras, whether it's a DSLR or a small handy cam, partly because the, quali- the image quality of those, of those cameras has, has massively improved you know, from what was available in the, say, the, in the 90s to what's available now. The, the quality of the sensor and the features on the cameras has massively changed. So you don't, you're not, it used to be an issue of technology restricting you to a certain type of camera. Now you have a range of very useful, small camera uh, pieces of camera technology with various add-ons. So for something like that, where you're going to be leaping in and out of vehicles, crawling through sort of crawl spaces in sort of you know busted houses and, and rubble and walls, and having and snipers pinging sn- at you, snipers pinging at you and clambering over roofs and what have you, I've done that with a big camera, and it will literally break you. You come, you you know, and also you be, you're a bigger target. Exactly. Yeah. And also those bigger cameras, they need bigger batteries, and they needed the stock and what have you to carry all. So the t- the in something like this, the technology has improved so much and has miniaturized. It means that you can do more with less. You know, you could have your body armor on. You've got your pouches on front of your body armor, and you just stuff it full of kind of media cards and small bat and the small batteries you put in the, um, and you could shoot for an entire day. And then, but before I'd be worrying about, well, I've only got a forty-minute tape, and I've only got three more tapes in my bag. That's what. That's the kind of the thought process I had to go on. And these days, if you are in, if you have placed yourself and your colleagues in that danger situation, you don't want to be in a situation where you're not able to cover the story because it just negates the reason for you being there because the the, the cost imperative for you being there uh, and the danger you're putting yourself in, you want it to count for something. You want to, you want, you don't want to hang around these places. You want to get in, get out. You want to tell the story, get in, get out. And if the smaller kit helps you do that more effectively, more expediently, that's what you use. I mean, people say to me all the time, oh, what's the best camera? I says, well, it's the, it's the camera you've got with you at the moment. And I've shot things on iPhones 
because it happened to suit the scenario that we were in and it became part of the program and the sequence because it's all I had at the time. So, and also, everyone, everyone's got a phone these days, but if you turn it with a camera, you are raised with suspicion. You know, you, you're, you're passing through a territory where the media are not well regarded and you're trying to film a checkpoint as you're going through to, to build up the tension for the story. And they see you filming on a, on a camera, even a small one. They might confiscate it. You might have lose everything. You might have lose everything you've done for that day, or, or you might lose the camera. But you can just put your mobile phone in camera mode and put it on the dashboard as it goes as it goes to the checkpoint, and they're none the wiser because lots of people mount mobile phones on dashboards these days because of sat navs. So it's literally just do what you can to tell the story. You can You do what you can to tell the story. So I've used big cameras. I've used small cameras. I've used medium cameras, and it, it's all about perception of the story that you're trying to tell, how quickly you need to move, how dangerous it might be, and also the perception of how you're going to be received. Because you got to remember, if you're in a, a non-first world location, often you will choose um, cameras that will appear less threatening. Because if, you know, if you're a you know, big person, you're carrying all this strange equipment, and you put it on your shoulder, you, know, you might have met people who, who have only ever seen... Uh, or suffered at the hands of security forces or been war ravaged. And so, certain bits of the kit, it does look, you know, at first sight as if it's like a, you know, like a camera can be put on your shoulder like a rocket launcher or like grip something, they look like a pistol. And some people see that and it genuinely scares them. So you have to be mindful of who you're going to meet and how you're going to present yourself from the very first moment you get out of the, the car, the four-wheel drive, the boat, the however you've got there. What I learned to do is, I, I like to refer back to the phrase of a very famous uh, photographer from the 1920s who, you were, who worked originally for the uh, US Farms and Labour Board, um, a d documentarian called uh, Walker Evans. And his, his favourite phrase, which I've adopted and used every time, is stare. It's the only way to educate the eye. Just step back. Just take a view. Just smile at people. Think about how you're carrying your equipment even. And just, you know, show willing and be nice to people. Because some people, you know, genuinely will be terrified or certainly at ill at ease with you. Unfortunately, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. I wish we could, uh, we okay, could literally thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> speak all day about this. But um, I just want to move on to some listeners' questions. So the first question that I have for you is, um, I'm just starting out in documentary filmmaking. At some point, I want to start going for work. Which is most important, buying kit or building my portfolio? Build your portfolio. Absolutely. It used to be the case that owning the kit would get you the job. Now there is so much kit out there at different price points um, and different requirements for different manufacturers. You will bankrupt yourself trying to buy all the kit that you think you need to get the work. My, 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 my view now is, even though I'm a kit owner and I still buy a lot of kit, I'm assured of what I'm trying to do. If you are starting out and you might be branching out into different areas, especially with the current situation, I would build your portfolio rather than your kit cupboard. Obviously, you might buy a couple of very specific lenses or one camera body that you prefer to work with. But above that, there are enough hire houses out there. There's enough contacts and connections. So I would build your portfolio first rather than just relying on having the kit to get you the work. Perfect answer, perfect. Um, second question is, can you pinpoint one job or moment that's landed you the roles you have today? Very early on, I met a couple of people um, at the BBC from my through my work of doing kind of uh, local current affairs and then branching out into sort of networks of television and consumer affairs. I, there's two people I've met certainly at the BBC and I can then trace my entire networked television career, certainly for British television, from those two people because there's two people I met. They introduced me to certain programmes I got on well with them, and as they started to move, they decided to bring me with them, and that opened up a whole raft of different doors and possibilities. So there's a network television career, and I also have one for my American clients, because I used to own an NTSC kit before it was switchable from Palin NTSC. Um, and so I have two sort of network family trees that stem from three key people. Uh, everything flows out from that. So it wasn't much, so much a shoot, but it was just meeting 
those people to do the shoot, whatever it was, and then stepping from that and prospering from that moment, doing a good job, and then um, fanning out from there. Perfect. And the final question of this fascinating listeners' question bit: um, coverage or composition, which is most important? And there's there's one case I can think of uh, in the Ross Camp in Afghanistan first series I did, where I tried for coverage and I couldn't actually even get the camera up on my shoulder because we were so so pinned down. So it was a case of just keep rolling because the audio became more important. And there certainly was no composition. It was a case of me trying to just rotate the camera and point it in vaguely the right direction, being vaguely exposed and vaguely focused, trying to just do everything by fingertip control, not actually seeing what I was doing, just relying on my skills and hoping that I, was, that I hadn't pressed the record button by accident and it was no longer recording. Um, so... Coverage content will get you a long way, but composition helps. Nice. Nicely put like that. Um, just to wrap off today and the podcast sure. as well. So uh, one thing that's going to be a recurring theme throughout the podcast is the Desert Island kit list. So imagine that you've just been washed ashore. You've only got three items in your kit bag, but you could you, you chose those before you left anyway. So you, you're well prepared. Which three items would you pack? You've got one camera one light and one lens to take with you on your desert island to document your time there. Okay. Um, Camera-wise, I'd probably take a Leica rangefinder because it would, it would survive getting washed ashore, the salt. It's very robust. Um, a lovely camera. Lovely little camera. Um, single lens, probably 35 millimeter because you can do a whole range of different things with it because it is technically the human field of view, roughly, without the peripheral vision. So you can do full length, full length shots with it, uh, obscuring the, the extraneous. And you can also do lovely portrait photography with it if you ga- engage with your subject. So 35 millimeter lens. Um, lighting wise, well, lights wouldn't survive seawater. So you take a large ultra bounce uh, of some description to utilize uh, the sun's power, the sun's rays, and then you can, you know, you can shoot it sort of any time of the day, pretty much. Because you can use it as a shade, you can use it as a bounce, you can use it sort of as a, as a, as a, you know, reflector. Good stuff. And who do you, who would you get to uh, distribute your documentary, Desert Island? <laughs> no, we'll, we'll leave that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now it's been really, really good to chat today, Thank Jonathan. Thank you so much no for problem. coming on the podcast. And with that, we've reached the end of episode two. I want to say a huge thank you to Jonathan for joining us. I really hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or audience questions, please drop us an email to hello at utlpod.com. That's short for under the lights pod. As always, if you've enjoyed it, please help us spread the word. Just drop a link to your mates in your WhatsApp. On next week's episode, we have the fantastic photographer Vincent Tremo. It's definitely not one to miss, so make sure you're subscribed. Thanks so much for listening. I've been Cy Gamble and I'll speak to you soon. Under the Lights Podcast.